So she has a PJ, PJ, <laughs> she has PJs. I did read something super creepy and I did read A Dark Academia, but <laughs> I don't know. So this is set in, so this book kind of fits the Dark Academia. Why did my voice crack? Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be the first part of what I read in October because I still have one week left in the month, but I am making some good traction. I am cautiously optimistic that I am going to knock out some more books and rather than give you guys like one of those epic 35 minute videos, I thought I would break it down into two parts because I have so many books to talk about and so many things to say. I have a lot of thoughts this month when it comes to books. I'm looking at my list because I'm still old school and I wrote it all down. <laughs> So despite the fact that I made like a full blown spooky video, TBR, dark academia video, TBR, I basically deviated in like 17 different directions from it because some books came to me in the mail, because I am a mood reader and I went where the mood went, because I had some books on hold at the library that came through, so I read those. I just, I, this is why I don't make TBRs, you guys. I cannot stick to, a strategy. So I did do checking my list. Basically, we're just going to be all over the place as usual. So let's dive in and get started. So the first book I have is an arc that I got from Minotaur, and this is Finley Donovan Knocks Him Dead by El Casamano. So this actually comes out February 1st of 2022. So I know I'm talking about this really early, and I know that's super annoying because it's not going to come out for a few months. But let me just tell you guys that this book will be worth waiting for because it is a great sequel. And you guys know that I loved Finley Donovan is Killing It. I've talked about it so many times on here and this book does not disappoint. And I feel like it's hard to talk about because A, it's a sequel and B, it's not gonna be out for a while. But trust when I say it's really well done. I was totally into it. I was so happy to be back with Finley and Vero. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil anything from book one, but again, this book has total dead to me vibes that Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini show on Netflix, which I talked about last time I talked about this book. It's smart. It's funny. There's good mystery to it. A lot of characters from the first book are back. There's also an expansion in the cast of characters that we get. We get to see more of Finley's family. I love the dynamics between Finley and her family. I love Finley and Vero. They're just such girl goals, like best friend goals, and how they get themselves in and out of trouble and how they navigate the different messes that wind up on their front doorstep. I just love it. I love the characters. I love the humor to this. I feel like I said that already, but I'm such a fan of this book. I a thousand percent will be buying it when it comes out, but I was so excited to be able to get the arc of this. And you guys, I just... Not that I'm trying to fast forward time or anything, but I feel like 2022 can't come fast enough because there are so many amazing books coming out. So if you haven't already read Finley Donovan is Killing It, the upside is you have a few months to do it. And if you have, you have something amazing to look forward to. So the first book I actually listened to and then I loved it so much, I was like, I'm gonna buy this for my shelf sometime. And then I had some gift card money for my birthday and I was like, I'm gonna buy it now. And that book is Never Saw Me Coming by Vera Kurian. And I loved this book, you guys. So this is a new release, this is a debut, and I am obsessed. I, this is one of those books that I full blown am like, close the book, ready to start all over again from the beginning because I loved it so much. And because I did the audiobook, I was not able to meaningfully dog ear it. So this book is not a representation of how much I love it because I need to go back in and mark all of the pages. So this book kind of fits the Dark Academia vibe. It takes place in a college campus and it is in DC. It's at John Adams University, which is basically like GW, I think. And we follow Chloe Severy is our main character. And it says on the top of the page, you should never trust a psychopath, but what if you had no choice? So Chloe is a freshman, she's an honor student, and she is one of seven psychopaths 
who gets to basically get a free ride at this college in exchange for being a participant in a psychology study studying psychopaths and psychopathic behavior. And Chloe, she's like down for the free tuition and all of that jazz. But her biggest motivation is there is a guy who goes to this school who she knows from when she was younger and she literally has come to the school to murder him. This has been her plan for years and she's here to carry it out. But then one of the people from the program is found dead in the psychology building and Chloe basically goes from hunter to prey and not only is she trying to execute her own plan of murder, she's trying to stay alive and trying to figure out who's trying to kill her and the other psychopaths in the study. So this is just such a wild ride. It is so well done. I loved these characters. We have multiple points of view and she is dark and funny and unapologetic and I loved everything about her. And what I also loved about this book is again, you've got three perspectives and you get to see sort of how they play with each other and try and manipulate each other and what they can and can't get away with because they all are carved from this stone of psychopath. This definitely falls into my favorite category of dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. And I honestly, I couldn't love it more. This is one of those books where things happened at such a rapid clip. It was one of those books where I was like, oh, okay, this reveal isn't gonna happen until later in the book, but there were so many surprises and so many turns and there was like a part of me that was trying to figure it out but there was another part of me that was just like totally in it for the ride and i can't i just cannot say enough good things about it so i will say this is a book that will not be for everyone this is not going to scratch everybody's itch if you don't like the dark and messed up if you don't like that kind of unlikable main character this might not be for you but i love unlikable main characters and again there's something about Chloe and these other characters in the book, like give me some Charlie Bear, give me these like frat boy bros. I just had such a great time with the writing of this and the characters in this. And I of course did my typical writer, author deep dive afterwards. And Vera Kurian is so interesting to me, not only in her writing and in her career trajectory, but also in her philosophy of thrillers and of different books. So she has a PhD in social psychology, so she knows her stuff. She is an expert in so many ways. She did a ton of research. And I was listening to one of the interviews that she was doing talking about thrillers. And she was saying how like, she's not in it for the twist and she doesn't think every thriller needs a twist. And it's about the characters and it's about the story. And she comes from the place that a lot of us thriller readers love where she plays fair. And she was like, I don't mind if somebody figures out the mystery before the reveal because the clues are planted there for you to figure it out. So if you figure it out, that's fine. If you don't figure it out, that's great too. And she's not there to like throw that giant twist that's gonna pull the, like the rug out from underneath you. So I really like her philosophy about, and I do love a good twist, but how twists have been overdone in a lot of books and a lot of books are written for the twist or around it. So the rest of the story doesn't necessarily make sense or maybe the characters aren't as interesting. So again, I really enjoyed it from all perspectives, but you guys, I loved this book. And when I had commented, I don't know if it was on my Goodreads or just my Instagram that I had finished it. Somebody had mentioned that they had struggled with it a bit, but they read it. The audiobook is tremendous. So if you're a little hesitant about it, or maybe you did struggle with the physical book, I would say go with the audio because I was propelled. I was looking for excuses to keep listening. I was looking for activities to keep doing so I could keep listening. So if you haven't figured it out already, um, did I say it once or twice? I love this book. The next book I listened to is Darling by Kay Ankrum. And if you guys watched my last wrap up or I don't even know if I talked about it in another video also, I listened to the original Peter Pan, which I had never read last month. And I have Lost in the Neverwoods by Aidan Thomas, which I plan to read. And then somewhere in between, I remember this book existed and I was able to get it from my library. And I was curious and I was like, let me just deep dive into Peter Panville. And this book is, inspired by not a retelling and this is i love me some dark and messed up this book is dark you guys this is set in modern day set in chicago 
and there were elements of this book that I really loved. So this book is YA, but it's very dark, it's very gritty, it's very grim at times, and it's really, to a degree, like a crime thriller. And whether this is intentional or not, or this is just me, I, of course, went into it having just come off listening to the original Peter Pan. And on one side, there were lots of great winks and nods to the original book, things I would not have picked up on had I not just read it. And we have all of our same characters in different roles. So Captain Hook is Detective Hook, the crocodile is a bounty hunter, and then like Tink is Peter's best friend still, but she's an actual human. So there's nothing fantastical about this book. But we get the Lost Boys, we get Peter's whole community set in Chicago, and it takes place for the most part over the course of one night. And Wendy is a teenager, she is new to town, she has been grounded, her parents have gone out for the night, and Peter shows up in her window, there's a reason for it, and she's charmed by him, and he invites her out, him and his friend Tink are going to a party, want to come, and she goes for it. And there's like the element of innocent Peter, innocent Wendy, off on this adventure, and things go wrong, but things go like really, really wrong in this book. And again, it's like so dark. And in so many ways, it's great that it's dark and I love me some dark and messed up. But in other ways, I kind of felt like, oh, it kind of ruined Peter Pan for me in some ways. And not that this is like a beloved book of mine because I literally had just read it for the first time last month. But I was just like, wow, this is definitely a dark look at this story. And so ultimately, this is not a fun loving, light, easy breezy book. It is about manipulation. It is about young people being preyed upon. There's an exploration of homelessness, of, you know, these lost boys being orphans. There's great representation in this book. So Peter and Tink are white, but Wendy is black. The group of the Lost Boys and their friends are people of different races from different cultures. You have queer teens, you have straight teens, and it's really an interesting exploration of a fairy tale that you think you know and have one perspective and one takeaway from, and how if you turn it on its head, how dark this story really is and can be. So again, there were elements of it that I really enjoyed. And I don't know if I just was sort of like, so taken aback by parts of it, but it's like the kind of story where it's like, it pulls you right in and I wanted to know what was gonna happen next. And it was sort of like one twist and turn after another. So I enjoyed it, I didn't love it, but I understand why people do love it. And I think again, it's just me needing to shake off that expectation that is like a light and fun story. And when you look at the darkness of it and you modernize the story, there is some really powerful writing in this and some really powerful messaging in this, but it is not, it is not kid friendly. It is not easy breezy. And that doesn't make it bad, but it was not what I was expecting. And I just, I didn't love it. Next up, we have to talk about Wonderland by Jennifer Hillier. You guys, oh, it's, oh, it's being shiny. It has a shiny cover. Why did I sleep on Jennifer Hillier's backlist? I mean, that is like the biggest question. This book was creepy. It was dark. It gripped me. It's police investigation. It's mystery. It is everything I want and love from Jennifer Hillier. And I discovered her through Jar of Hearts. And she wrote this right before Jar of Hearts, or it was the book that preceded Jar of Hearts, and it gave me those vibes. She does wonderfully messy, imperfect characters. Things get dirty. Things do not always wind up in a happy bow. People make mistakes. People make bad choices. Dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I can't believe not only did it take me as long as it took me to get it, after I got it, it took me way too long, which is like months to read it. I loved it. And so unlike me, I did not want to dog ear this book. So I have like these two little tabs in it that I never, it's not, I'm not, um, 
I don't annotate my books, but I was like, let me just, let me just put two little flags in. And I could have flagged up the entire book also because it was so good. But I just, you guys don't sleep on this book. Go find it. It's perfect for spooky season. It's perfect for any time of year. This is set in Seaside, Washington. So fictional town and it's a small town and everything revolves around this amusement park because it brings tourists in. It employs tons of people and the success of this amusement park directly impacts the success of the town. So if anything goes a little bit wrong at this place, there's a weird relationship between the police and the owners of Wonderland and things don't always get investigated. Things kind of get swept under the rug and things are just a little bit strange. So we have a brand new detective in town, Vanessa Castro, and she has to move there because she's got some of her own baggage that she was escaping from Seattle. So she moves to town. Her husband has passed away. She has two kids and she had spent some summers in the town and actually had worked at Wonderland back in the day. So she has a little bit of familiarity, but she's the outsider and people are not always jazzed about an outsider. And when a dead body and not just any dead body, I have to read it. The dead decaying body left in the midway for all the wonder workers to see shows up. <laughs> like there is no hiding this. There is no sweeping this body under the rug. And Vanessa has no one to impress, nothing to lose. She's not tied to anyone. And she is in it to figure out what the heck is going on here. I loved this book, you guys. I loved it. It was twisty. It was great atmosphere. I wasn't sure what was happening. There's a great cast of characters. They're just, they're well-developed. They're very distinct. You know who's who. You can recognize them by their voice. You, it's not even like an unreliable narrator situation, but it's one of these things where like a lot of these people are dark and messed up. So like, you don't know who to trust. I found myself rooting for certain people because I tend to do that, but I just loved it so much. And there is a wink in this slash there's a character in this who was in her first two books, Freak and Creep or Creep and then Freak, which I haven't read yet, but I recognized the name and the sort of wink to the case from that because I know a little bit about those books and I need to read them next and I, just, and I need to read The Butcher and I need to read everything, everything until her new book comes out next summer. But I love this one so much, you guys. It's fat. I read it quickly. I couldn't get enough of it. I really couldn't. And oh my God, she's so good. So good. And then next up is another book that I absolutely loved. You already saw it with a dark and messed up main character who is everything and then some. And it's My Sweet Girl by Amanda J. Atisa. And I've talked about this before. I watched a live that Abby from Crime by the Book did this summer. And it was with Riley Sager, obviously. And she was saying how this was her favorite thriller of the year. And she obviously had an arc of it. And I had added it to my Amazon list back in the summer because I was like, I'm going to have it, need to have it. This sounds amazing. And she wasn't wrong. I mean, she's never wrong, but she wasn't wrong. Ah, I loved this book so much. So this was so kindly sent to me by one of my viewers, Teresa. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So much appreciation for this and like too much that you sent this to me. And I just, not, oh, I mean, I'm fast. The cover is everything, but this book is so good. So another debut novel, blown away by the debuts. I mean, there's so much crazy talent out there. She is a thousand percent an autobi author for me already. I can't wait to see what she does next year. And this one is How Your Past Always Catches Up With You. So this one follows a woman named Paloma. She is living in San Francisco. And when the book opens, she is at the bank trying to get some money because her roommate is blackmailing her because her garbage roommate went through her stuff and found out one of her secrets and is using it against her. But when Paloma gets home, she finds her roommate dead at the kitchen table. <laughs> what? And uh, yeah, she's kind of freaked out about it. So understandably, and she makes a run for it. And long story short, by the time the police actually show up, her roommate's not there anymore. And there's no evidence that he ever was. Never mind, is there any evidence that there was a dead body in her kitchen? So what did she see? Who was this guy? What is going on here? But Paloma is convinced that all of this stuff that is happening is tied to her past, 
when she grew up at an orphanage in Sri Lanka. And she is absolutely convinced that something from her past has made its way to her present, and that is what's haunting her. So we get dual timelines from her past childhood in Sri Lanka, and then we get the present day in and around San Francisco. She winds up kind of escaping to her parents' house, and she is just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And you guys, I would go in knowing nothing more than that, and I don't think you'll be disappointed. And very much like, I will say, I don't know if this is gonna be a for everyone book, but very much like Chloe and Never Saw Me Coming, but different. She is smart and snarky and funny and witty. And whereas in this book, Chloe has no problem saying it out loud into your face. A lot of Paloma's dark and messed up and funny snarky thoughts are in her head, but I loved her. I loved the writing of this book. I loved the twists and turns. There were moments where I thought I had figured something out and I was wrong about it. And mm, I just don't wanna say anything because I don't wanna risk giving anything away, but she's such a strong main character. The writing is beautiful. I just loved it so much. You guys know I love a multiple timeline book, a mystery in the past, a mystery in the present. And I just thought it was amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. This one, I did have the physical book of it, so I did start to dog ear it quite a bit. And this is another book that I absolutely will reread soon, if I can get to it, because I just loved it so much. And I also deep dove on author interviews with her, and I just find her story fascinating. And I just think she's such an amazing writer. And again, debut book, debut book, what an incredible month, you guys, but highly, hugely recommend these books. Loved them. The next book I listened to is Last Night at the Viper Room, River Phoenix and the Hollywood He Left Behind by Gavin Edwards. And I listened to the audiobook of this as well. And I just, I it wasn't even like I needed a palate cleanser, but I kind of have gotten into reading about some celebrity stories. And this one has been on my list for a while. I was a River Phoenix fan. And I was familiar with him, but not super deep dive familiar with him. So he died in the early morning hours of October 31st, 1993. And he died outside the Viper Room, which is why that's the name of this book. And what I had assumed was going to be a story about sort of birth until his tragic death was actually so much more in that it talks about, like it says, the Hollywood he left behind. And what it actually does is follows the careers of so many actors and actresses that he worked with, that he came up with in the industry. And Johnny Depp at the time owned the Viper Room. So it talks about Johnny Depp's career throughout and sort of the parallels between River Phoenix's coming up in Hollywood with other actors like Leonardo DiCaprio and Ethan Hawke and Keanu Reeves, and then relationships he had with Martha Plimpton and Samantha Mathis. And it shows where different people were at different times. So before their paths had crossed, or if Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix went out for the same movies and they did Explorers together when they were kids, but then maybe River got something or Ethan got something. And how had River Phoenix not died that night, what his career possibly could have been or what trajectory he could have been on. And he has a very famous family. Obviously, Joaquin Phoenix is his younger brother, his sisters Rain and Summer. And it's really interesting seeing where all of these other actors and actresses were at the time and the choices he made in his movies. And it is definitely, it's really sad. It's really hard to read with the addiction and with the people that were around him and something that I think has always been and probably still very much is prevalent in Hollywood and things that I was reading about when I read the Rob Lowe book and the Demi Moore book is how people turned a blind eye as long as the talent showed up or how things were forgiven and things were not always addressed. And Demi Moore got put into rehab because they said either like, you go get cleaned up or you're not gonna get this movie. And some of these restrictions were not on him. and he wasn't open to a lot of things of getting help or didn't think he had a problem necessarily. And it's really sad to look at it in hindsight, but I didn't know as much about all of the details of his career. So I'd seen Stand By Me, I saw Jimmy Reardon, 
I saw my own private Idaho. I don't think I fully understood it at the time, so I definitely want to go back and watch that. Weirdly enough, Turner Classic Movies had Dogfight on, which I remember seeing once a long time ago, more because Lily Taylor, who was in Say Anything and Mystic Pizza, amongst a whole bunch of other things, is in it, and I loved her. And then they also had that thing called Love, which is the last movie he fully completed, which he made with Samantha Mathis and Dermot Mulroney and Sandra Bullock. So I've recorded them, I haven't watched them yet. So it's a really interesting but sad story and I didn't even intentionally pick it up this month because he passed away this month, but it was one of those things where I like remembered it but sort of forgot about it. So I enjoyed it as much as I feel like you can enjoy a story that is sad. Uh, it, it's a really nice appreciation and retrospective of his career and just a real acknowledgement of the like the huge talent that he was and it talks a lot about his activism and how ahead of his time he was in so many ways as well so i enjoyed it if you were a fan of his if you enjoy celebrity biographies i would give it a go the audiobook is pretty good i will say the narrator at times frustrated me a little bit because he had like a few different voices he would do so whether it was like Keanu Reeves or he was doing a Johnny Depp or the, you know there's different actors and, and directors and producers and, and people who were commenting on this and Tarantino is one of them. So it's like the audiobook guy had a couple different voices so he would do a Keanu impression for lack of a better word but then he would be like a different actor and he would still be in Keanu voice or he would be doing Tarantino but not quoting Tarantino so I was just sort of like maybe it would be better if you just sort of like used your regular voice and then I found whether this was like intentional or not when he was doing the women's voices they were very sort of soft and like I don't, I don't really know I'm not really sure and I don't know if he meant for them to sound really shy and soft but it seemed very weird that he had these like booming male voices but when he did the women and this is maybe me projecting stuff it seemed like he definitely made them I don't want to say subservient is not the right word but there definitely was like a different intonation when he was doing the women's voices which I just found strange and slightly distracting but the content of the book was really good so again liked it definitely want to deep dive in all of River Phoenix's movies now and again I would recommend it if it's your thing so that's going to do it for the first part of what I read in October and you guys all in it's been a good month so far so let me know if you've read any of these books thoughts about them, other feelings, and I will be back later with the rest of what I'm reading. I have an, I still have a week left in October. I'm doing something I normally never do, and I didn't really do this on purpose, but I have five books going right now, which I never do, but I started Saw Kill Girls. It was, it's definitely dark and messed up. It's giving me House of Hollow vibes. And I had to put a pin in it because I was reading it at the same time I was reading Wonderland and it was like too much dark and messed up happening at once. So I definitely need to like differentiate my books. And I started reading Cackle by Rachel Harrison because it's witchy and I was listening to a podcast and I'm loving it so far. And I was starting The War of Art because I'm trying to get in the mindset for NaNoWriMo. And then my audiobook for Atomic Habits came in. So I started listening to that. And then my audiobook for The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth came in. So I'm listening to that. And I also have the ebook of that, <laughs> so, which is like mine. I got the arc of it. So I just, I have way too many things going on, but I'm loving all of them. So I just need to commit and I'm going to, I'm just going to get some more done and I will let you guys know all about it when we get there. But for now, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching and hanging out today. I hope you guys are having or had a fabulous October reading month, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye.